worked on to build the first digital bank uh, in Africa about that's now 20 years ago odd. I've uh, created various technologies. I've sold technology patents to Google. Uh, I raised one of the largest VC funds um, in South Africa, which was a 100 million rand fund back in the day. I managed to leave that fund, turn down their term sheet, uh, raise some money out of Silicon Valley without ever having visited Silicon Valley at all, uh, twice now. And um, moved along the journey of being both a VC, but also a startup raising, and then obviously participating in the ecosystem, as well as running a couple of other businesses where I managed to sell them along the way. Thanks so much, Craig. So I see we've got some um, familiar faces on the line with us and some of our entrepreneurs that you have addressed previously as well. Today, I'm going to be chatting to Craig about what do investors look when they want to invest in a startup? Now, I've sat on the other side. Craig has sat on the other side on far more um, tables as I have. And, you know, entrepreneurs come on board and startups come on board thinking that there are certain things they need to present. And that's what investors look for. Investors, on the other hand, are looking for something very specific. So, Craig, how do we get investors to take startups seriously? What do startups need to start doing differently? Okay, so I think there's there's a few things. I think the first, sort of the biggest mismatch that starts, and obviously, again, I've sat on, on both sides of the table, raising money, giving money. Um, the first thing is to validate your idea. We, we have a lot of people who come to us with, just an idea. They haven't built anything. They haven't done anything. And one of the first rules to know is that an idea is worth zero. In fact, it's worth less than zero. Lots of people have ideas. The ability to execute that idea on a world-class level is worth 10% of your success. And the ability is to find product market fit, find customer, that's about 90% of, of, of your success. We also then tend to, to, to hit this immediate wall with um, you know, managing expectation of both parties. And it usually goes a little something like this. The entrepreneur comes to us and says, I've got a fantastic idea. The inflatable kitten market is worth $85 billion. Therefore, you need to give me $40 billion right now, even though I haven't done anything. And, and sure, one day you might build a $40 billion startup, but it's not that now. So there has to be a reasonable expectation of how much money they're, they're looking for. And then finally, kind of just also, a lot of people don't come with the business plan or the right unit economics or understanding revenue. They're just to think you're going to give them free money and everything's going to work out. And unfortunately, money kind of works the other way. The, the, you've got to be careful what you wish for, because once you get it, you actually have to deliver. And, and there's some very big expectations on, on what that would look like. I believe you're on mute, Jayshree. Sorry, Craig. There was a there was a little puppy barking in the background, so I decided to mute myself. Didn't want him to join the session. Craig, you mentioned idea validation. So what what is that for those attendees that don't understand idea validation? Can you share with them how does one validate their ideas? Certainly. Um, so this is actually a very easy process. What I need you to do, let's say you've got an idea right now. I want you to run out uh, after lockdown and, and, and find 100 people. And I want you to ask them a few questions. First, you want to talk about your problem. So the, the problem is I need an inflatable kitten. Um, if I could solve your problem, would you pay me money for it? How much would you pay for it? If I could deliver it in such and such a way, would you buy it specifically from me? And try and figure out also what the, the lifespan of that customer would be. How many inflatable kittens in the 10 years there are your customer would you need? And if you can kind of ask any combination of those five questions um, and 100 people say yes, you've got a business. If you can't get 100 people to, to say yes, then you don't possibly have a business. And, and so you can, you can do that for free right now. It's a very easy way to go kind of test an idea. Um, and that's also what's meant by product market fit. And product market fit is the most important thing in the world. It basically boils down to do enough people need what you've got? Is it at the right price? Would they buy it for you? Then you know your product is fit because people are voting with their wallets. And if you can get that one element right, everything else will come in. 
there's good examples of businesses like Ride. Ride, you probably, no one here has ever heard of. Um, they raised $86 million before Uber was even Uber. The less cost routing technology that's in Waze was part of their system. And they had to write a very soppy um, blog post that was, that was very whiny about how they failed because Uber was more aggressive in the market by getting customers and making sure their product was better. And, and, and I can have no sympathy for Ride because at the end of the day, just having an idea isn't enough. Listening to your customers, having that fit, asking those questions. Because something I say to a lot of my, my digital customers when we do digital transformation is, I'm an expert, therefore I do not know what my customers want. You've got to go ask them. And the funny thing about customers, if you ask them, they'll tell you. Absolutely. You know, and we always talk about this when we teach innovation as well, that ideas are a dime a dozen. It's only when that idea is implemented, generates value, and that value is sustainable, does it become an innovation. So it's really good to dispel those myths that ideas can get the investment they need. You can't unless you prove your value. So Craig, I know that we also sit with a situation where entrepreneurs and startups don't come equipped with the right type of presentation that they need to take investors through. So what do investors look for? I know you've got some pitch decks and um, before we get there, let's take some comments. I see there's some stuff coming through the chat. Guy Harris is on the line, by the way. Thanks Guy for joining us in Cape Town. Um, thanks for that lovely comment as well. We miss you too. We'll tell you when we in Cape Town so we all can maybe have a coffee and um, <laughs> yeah so it's been a while and guy is also quite a, an active player in the ecosystem and thank you guy for all the work that you do with entrepreneurs and startups as well so craig let's move on to what do we look for in a presentation deck as an investor from the other side okay so let me just share my screen and i'm going to share something that is very accessible to everyone if you were to Google the only 10 slides you need in a pitch, you will come up with Guy Kawasaki's uh, current pitch deck. And this is the perfect format, whether it's Sequoia and Reese and Horowitz, no matter who you're pitching, most of their template decks are based off this original one. Now, there's a couple of rules um, to a pitch deck. A pitch deck is supposed to be something that is short and easy to consume. Guy Kawasaki talks about the 30-20-10 rule. You want to use a 30-point font. Now the 30 point font stops you from writing full, long, horrible sentences on your deck because the moment you have to start reading off a pitch deck, the people you're presenting to will just read off your pitch deck and you will lose your connection with them. 20 minutes is the amount of time you will typically get with a VC. So in your mind, I actually want you to read that as three minutes. You wanna be able to present your deck in three minutes and allow the VC that 17 minutes to ask you questions and help sell themselves on your idea. And the final point is 10 slides. You only ever want to have 10 slides. VCs get sent decks all the time. When I was a VC, I saw over 2000 businesses in the last fund and the new fund I'll probably see more. And of those 2000, only five were investable. So I'm, I'm already, as a day job, I was getting flooded with all these decks. So please, please, please don't send a 90 page deck more slides will actually hurt you. You want less slides that show a clear understanding. The good news here is that if you use these 10 slides, right up until you're asking for about 10, $15 million, these 10 slides will actually be all you need along with the checklist I'm gonna give you just after this. And so let me break down what, what they expect to see. So your first slide is just your title and it's very simple. What is your company name? That's it. No one cares about who you are. I don't walk up and go, hi, I'm Craig. I'm a Gemini. I like long walks or hate long walks on the beach. Simply, we're box commas. There we go. Your second slide is your problem or opportunity. Now, problem and opportunity are the same thing. Problem says there's a need in the market. And the more painful the problem and why they use the word problem is the more valuable it is to solve that problem. So in this particular case, your problem statement could be, I don't like instant coffee. Uh, I'd really like a one-touch machine that makes fantastic coffee. There's nothing on the market, and that'd be something like an espresso machine. So you'd say something along the lines of, right now, people have to make instant coffee. It's really terrible, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, there are 20 million people who need it. 
your value proposition. So this is really how you're going to solve that pain. And, and again, it just needs to be simple. Um, if you were looking at something like Uber, um, taxis are really expensive and we found a way to make it cheap and we don't need to buy tons and tons of taxis to do it. Other people will use their cars and you know that's the beginning of the sharing economy. So just really about how you're going to solve the problem. Once you've said how you're going to solve the problem, you get to the underlying magic slide or the secret source slide. And the secret source slide, again, ideas are dime a dozen, as Jayshree said. It, it's really a why you slide. What have you done slightly differently? What have you figured out? What have you done that, that, that has more empathy for the problem or for your customer that's going to give you an advantage against anyone else who might have had the same idea? And trust me, there's lots of people who've had the same idea. Wait, then from... Sorry, sure. Craig, let's just pause there for a moment and go back to um, the title. So one of the things, and this is where, you know, sometimes startups and entrepreneurs get conflicting messages as well, because we also tell startups and entrepreneurs that investors invest in the person. Um, so where in this deck do you get to actually share who you are and more about your accolades or why invest in you, the person behind the business? So there is a slide coming towards the last 20% of, of this deck, which will talk about your team. And I'm also going to give you some tips on, on what you should say and what you shouldn't say when talking up yourself and your team. Um, but absolutely, there is going to be a portion where you're going to talk about the team who has the ability to execute this. And there's going to be some interesting and also a little bit of counterintuitive advice I'm going to give when we get to that as well. But it will come. And what I, what I just want to add on this as well, Craig, and, and I'm glad you, you mentioned the team slide that's going to be coming up, is we've seen slide decks from startups where the first slide is this huge picture of the person that's standing in front of you and presenting their deck, right? And please, please, please <laughs> don't do that because you look like this. <laughs> And that's like, uh, so it's something we definitely want to encourage uh, startups to avoid. You know, you are standing in front of these investors. You don't need your face on the first slide of a presentation deck. So thank you so much for highlighting that. And we'll move on. Certainly. Okay, once you've described what is the problem, your, your unique approach to, to solving the problem as a value proposition, and the underlying magic you're going to use to solve it, what I really want to know is your business model. I want to know how you're going to make money because if I give you $10 million today, I want $100 million back in six years. So I need to see that you understand how you're going to make money. Um, and this is a very simple slide. I'm actually, I'll, I'll show you some example decks at some point as well. But this is typically if I think of one of my own businesses that's just raised again, it's we make money from transactions, from logistics, and from um, an annual uh, fee. It's very simple. Where is the money coming from? How will you make money? This will be paired with a document that you will provide, which is a two-year to five-year projection of how you will spend that money, how you'll use that money, but you don't need to put that in your PowerPoint. Again, this PowerPoint you're going to present in three minutes. So really, it's almost you know, a couple of, you've got 10 slides. So you can imagine it's 20 seconds a slide. Okay, so then we want to understand go to market. How are you going to go get your customers? Because remember, customers are the only thing that matters. So how are you going to go get them? Tell me your plan. Tell me the different channels of acquisition. Let me understand the different verticals or horizontals you're going to play in to find those customers. And, and really, this is a very important slide, these two slides. When you ask me for money, I want to see at least 80% of that total lump sum earmarked for getting customers and revenue. I don't want to see fancy offices, six PAs for the CEO. That is the worst possible thing to show me. I don't want to suddenly see inflated salaries. What you really want to know is that you're going to ask for enough money. You have a plan to spend that money for a minimum of 24 to 36 months, and that's very key. If I give you money, you have to survive long enough to show lots more revenue so I can sell off my risk as the VC investing in you to the next guy. So you've got to show in that 36 months as well that, that you have done enough to get more revenue to justify going from a 10 million check 
to a 50 million check. And if you get 50 million in the next round, well, then you've made me 5X richer and, and I love you for it. So you have to have a real understanding of how you're gonna spend that money. Okay, you're on mute. No problem. The next thing is competitive analysis. Nothing says you don't know your business like saying, oh, we have no competitors, we're the best. I hear that a lot. And the problem is a VC has probably read your deck before. And if they don't know your area of expertise, they will get someone in to attend or give them advice beforehand. A lot of VCs phone me regularly, you know about X industry, give me a quick rundown on this deck, tell me where the pitfalls are, tell me who the competitors are. And we normally do. So nothing shows you haven't done your homework like saying, um, I've got no competitors. You've always got competitors and you knowing them and understanding how you're going to beat them in the market is super important. The next part, and this is the slide where you get to talk about yourself. This is the management team slide. And guess what? Do you know what you shouldn't do? You really shouldn't talk about yourself. What you should talk about is the great team of people who are smarter than you, who are better than you, who have relevant experience in the taxi industry or whatever particular industry you're trying to disrupt and how they as a team are going to help you succeed because one person is never going to be able to do it on their own. There is a fair amount of super ego you need when you, you're going to do a startup. There's nothing reasonable or sane about being a startup. Startups attract, the, the best startups are incredibly damaged, narcissistic, interesting people because they have to be. There's nothing sane or reasonable about me saying to you, hi, with no money, I'd like you to build a $60 billion business in six years that doesn't exist where all market forces are against you. There's nothing sane or reasonable about that. There is nothing sane or reasonable about the sacrifices you are going to have to make to get there. So let's assume that you're a little bit nuts. So maybe we don't want to talk about you too much in the management deck. And, and let's assume that you are at least smart enough or you have enough, enough self-awareness to put a team of people around you who can get you there and where you will just provide the vision and get there. You provide the crazy, they provide the work. The other thing to, to please, 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 please not do is tell me about random little startup things you've won and stupid little articles in some random, you know, something burn or something crunch. No one cares about your press releases and PR. In fact, it's a signal, a signal to me and any other VC that you are focused on the wrong things. You are focused on the attention and the spotlight. You're not focused on building a good business. I once took one of the top three VCs in the world to an event in Cape Town and one of those typical silicone kind of things. And he said, who are these startups? I wanna know who they are because they're completely uninvestable if this is what they're doing, hanging around at these kind of circle jerk events. And it's an important thing. No one wants to see you've won favorite startup this year. And there's a lot of times when I was a VC where people who were featured as the, as a list, I'm always proud whenever my startup is not on it. It's the best startup in South Africa. Because usually almost everyone on that list has come to me in the last six months because they're going bankrupt, have no money, have no revenue, or desperately need funding. And it's very easy to get on those lists. You want to get on a Forbes list or this list or that list, I can make two phone calls, I can put you on that list. But what I'm telling you is it's a very poor signal to any VC. So please, don't do the big picture. Please don't take the 30 foot neon sign to tell me how great you are, because it's usually a sign that you're not. Please focus on building a good team of people around you and, and, and building a good culture, because you're gonna need that. So Craig, before we move on, I see there's a couple of questions relating to some of the slides that's coming through on the chat. Certainly. So one of the questions was, um, you know, talking to a VC, do we sign NDAs for protection? <laughs> No, this is a pet bugbear with every VC in the world. So, so here's the, the modality of the thinking of the startup. My idea is so precious, no one will ever think of it. And if anyone steals it, I'll sue them for a billion rand. No, no, honey, sweetie, no, idiot, no, please don't do that. For every idea you bring to me, I've, sent, I've seen 10 teams who can do it better, who can execute it better, I'm going to back the one who I think has the best chance in the market. And you're not special. Your idea is not unique. And if you ask an, a VC to sign an NDA, they will typically tell you to get lost. There are a few who give you NDAs, but they give it from their side where there are no penalty clauses. And honestly, they're not that interested. Your idea, unfortunately, 
is not that special. When your idea is making lots of money, it's special. But until then, it's it's really not. So don't don't make your problems and insecurities and fears the problem of the VC. They just don't care. And if they pass on your version of inflatable kittens, I promise you, there's 55 other versions of inflatable kittens who they will talk to and will probably fund because those people aren't trying to be difficult. Mm -hmm. You cannot protect an early stage idea and even a late stage idea. If you're using something like patents, I can promise you, if a big company like like Apple comes along, they'll probably win even if they shouldn't. Um, patents protect those who have the most money. NDAs are great in a crisis when you didn't hold all the toilet paper. <laughs> okay, great. And you know, tying that back to competitive analysis, I've seen entrepreneurs stand up and say, we have no competitors <laughs> because no one else is doing what we do, right? And that's just, they just haven't done their homework or they're just thinking that what they do is so unique. And that's why they try and force the hand of getting you to sign NDAs. And like Craig said, most investors, most incubator heads don't have time to sign these NDAs. You must remember we're engaging with hundreds of entrepreneurs at any given time. So it's almost impossible to actually do the work that needs to be done if you are putting so much of effort into just getting past something like an NDA in order to work with you and help you grow your business. Yeah, why are you making it hard for me to give you money? Why are you giving me admin? Why? <laughs> Absolutely. And um, yeah, so um, there's also a question here around uh, mentors. So should you list your mentor as uh, part of your management team? No, because the moment I dig deeper and I've seen it on many decks where I actually know the mentors. I'm, I'm even listed on, 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 as a mentor on decks for people I've never ever met. They're, they're, my name gets used a lot um, for people I don't know. They, they hope that this somehow will get them more funded. It really doesn't. The kind of people who, if they were on your board as a shareholder, would actually count those count. Mentors don't count for anything. You should have mentors, and even my mentors have mentors have mentors. There's mentor inception happening everywhere. But ideally, they are just that, and they should be people relevant to your industry. Me going and getting um, the CEO of Coca-Cola as a mentor when I'm not in FMCG makes little or no sense. Um, so just thinking by adding a famous person on your deck, you're suddenly going to get funded as spurless. If anything, I'm going to challenge that to query it. It's going to make me look deeper because really they're not operational day to day in your business, which means they actually don't have any real affect in, in the outcome, which means I don't really care. If anything, I know you're now trying to lie to me and I'll look down on it. Okay. So Craig, I see we do have more questions coming through on the chat and Q and A, but let's continue with the slide deck and then we'll come back to these questions towards the end. Fantastic. I'm uh, almost done with this and then I've got a short checklist and that should leave us with a bit of time. Financial projections and key metrics. So this is a three-year forecast. It's a very simple graph. It shows your costs, it shows your spend, and it shows your revenue growth and your customer acquisition. And really at this point, I'll also see if you understand a couple of core things. CAC. Um, which is your, your customer acquisition cost. How much do you spend to get a customer? LTV, lifetime value, it costs you $100 in CAC to get that customer. How much is that customer going to spend with you over, let's say, the five years they're with you? And hopefully what I'm looking for is that your CAC is 100 and your LTV is maybe 1,000. Um, and then I want to see that all of this matches back to your business plan, your profitability, or what we call unit economics. If I can see the unit economics makes sense, if, if I can see the total addressable market size makes sense, then at that point, I can see you've got a good business. And really VC is pattern matching. We ask any one of 26 questions. Typically I ask you a permutation of maybe seven of those questions to figure out, is it scalable? Do I like the team? Does the business plan make sense? Will it potentially work really? And then the final part is your current status, accomplishments to dates, timeline and use of fund. Okie dokie, please. Please, please, I'm begging all of you out there, pretty please. I don't want to hear about which stupid startup award you want. I do not want to see your Silly Venture Burn article. I do not want to see anything remotely resembling a PR press release. Not a single thing. It doesn't mean anything. Customers giving you money, that means something. So when we say current status, where are you in your product lifestyle? 
where, where life cycle where are we you know do you have a product does it have first customers where are you in that idea seed late seed abc kind of stage accomplishments to date we've got 50,000 customers we're making x amount of revenue and then finally show me the timeline and use of funds i give you this money today what are you hoping to do with it and do you understand what you hope to do with it already and a lot of people come to us and they just go i want money and uh, and we go well that's great but what for do you have understanding how you're going to use those funds do you understand how that's going to play out over 24 to 36 months and and usually the answer is well no i just saw some other company got that amount of money so that's the amount of money i want which is which is lovely if people were giving out free candy but uh, that's not usually how it works we want to know what you're going to spend that candy on okay Thanks so much, Craig, and thanks for the entertaining approach that you took us <laughs> through those slides on. And uh, yeah, let's go through your famous checklist that I've been hearing so much about. Okay, so not my checklist, uh, not, not my writings, but this is from Y Combinator, who's done a lot of great work over the last 15 years to, to root out bad behavior, both by entrepreneurs and by investors, to, to create safe instruments for people to invest, um, even though I'm not a particular fan of the safe itself. Um, but a basic checklist of what you should need. <clears throat> so first off is your corporate documents. So this is really your letter of incorporation. You've typically incorporated in Delaware. You never want to incorporate a startup in somewhere like South Africa, for example. You always want to incorporate your, your startup in a country where the investors' lawyers know that they can high-five you or strangle you or they understand the law. Um, should anything go wrong. And that, that's very simple. There's only a handful of countries you set up, you create your startup in and you do it from day one because it's very expensive to move later. That is your Delaware, Singapore, Liechtenstein, um, all of your, your kind of your high end, decent tax, decent IP structure kind of, kind of places. Uh, London, Dubai, Free Zone, those are kind of the top five. You then have all your certificate of designation, stock rights, any previous term sheets, um, your cap table with your shareholder letters that show clearly who's involved in the business, and of course, maybe an org chart. Then, obviously, your business plan and financials, that, 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 that very important. People think you, you don't have to be good at all your admin. Go and get a, an accounting company. We use one for six grand a month who just once a month, the lady comes in for a few hours and she does our books and we've got audited accounts once a year and, and show that you are managing your money responsibly. Intellectual property. No one really cares how your business is structured. What they care is, is what they're investing in is what holds the IP that makes the money. So where is your IP? Where is your revenue? Where are the documents proving that the vehicle I'm investing in owns those particular things. Um, right, then from there, all of your security issuances. So securities are really, as you would think in terms of an American concept of securities. So these are your shareholder certificates, um, stocks and bonds, um, any past issuances, and any agreements relevant to that, like your term sheet, for example. And of course, little things like, have you paid your taxes? Those are very important. And also remember, you never want debt on your books. So we want to see a clean set of books, no debts, no weird loans, where suddenly we put money in, but the CEO takes 90% of it back into his own pocket. That'll never work. It just makes you uninvestable. Um, any agreements you have, um, obviously important leases, um, any obligations, any debts, anything you might hold that is relevant to the, to the company, any partnership agreements, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're looking for this list, which reaches very in-depth, um, you can just search uh, Y Combinator Series A checklist. Um, I'm not going to go into every single detail of the list because in that particular one, there's about 18 points, but you can easily look it up. I'll share the link um, with everyone that's attended, uh, Craig, after this. Certainly. Obviously, no disputes or litigation. If anyone's taking you to court or you've got a problem, you're probably uninvestable. You've got to solve that problem beforehand. And then obviously all the information regarding your HR. So make sure you're taking care of your employees, you're paying all your employee tax, you've got um, 
Very importantly, you've got your contractor agreements or your employee agreements in place. And obviously any equity pools or equity grants you may have made for your staff. It's good to have an equity pool to attract talent. Do not give equity too early. Equity pools for talent are sort of two, three years into the ride once you've raised money that equity is worth something and you're wanting the best talent. Don't give away something that's worth money, which is far more important to you early on, um, too early. Rather, once you're established and you're fighting Google for the best resource, you can still maybe win that uh, with your equity pool. I find a lot of the time the cap table is ruined and the cap table is just who owns what percentage of your business. Ideally at certain stages, so for example, if I'm in seed or late seed, I as the founder should still hold between 70 to 80% of my business um, because this is, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. So what I don't wanna see is between seven people, the, the founders now got 15% of the business because over the next four rounds of investment, the founder will, will basically become an employee and then they're not going to be motivated to work the insane hours seven days a week and really succeed at this thing. So you've got to make sure that cap table is very clean. And with that, I see there are lots of notifications coming. Shall we try to move to some of the questions? And I've yeah. still got about another 20 minutes. <laughs> so Craig, you can go into the Q&A. Um, there's a question from Raj. Uh, it yes. says, how do you cr curate potential investors? Spray and pray does not work. What's your funnel to get investors? Fantastic. And um, if you ever need a fantastic law firm, this is the right Raj to speak to. Denton's is actually the largest law firm in the world. So this is quite important. You, you don't want to take just anyone's money. In fact, uh, in, in one of my previous businesses, I spent a lot of money trying to exit a, a, an investor who became quite toxic because I didn't do the right kind of due diligence. They just had a lot of money. So Here's the first thing. You want to make sure they're aligned. And, and, and I'll, I'll give you a, a very good example. I, I, had a, I had a chat with a Chinese VC firm today at 10 and then a, another a VC firm out of India as well, sort of straight after that. And first, when you meet the VC, let them tell you about themselves. Everyone gets into the meeting, they're like, let me tell you about my idea, my idea, my idea. No, no. This will save you a lot of pain and heartache. This is a curation question. Tell us about yourself. And I want to know, what does your fund normally invest in? How big is your average ticket size? People think because I've got a hundred million rand total fund, I'm gonna give them a hundred million rand. I'm not, I'm gonna give them five to 6% of my fund total. So ask them what their average check size is. Ask them what they've invested in before because they might be into um, inflatable kittens, but you're in agri-tech and they it's just not compatible with the, with, you know, the kitten sharing community. Um, and already there, you'll start to disqualify most of the people you meet. And, and, and if you've done that early on, I can promise you it'll probably save you about 40 VC meetings because the, the kind of people who are probably going to invest in you, there's probably only three in the whole world. Um, Bill Gates has this lovely saying where he, uh, he spoke to over 500 people, um, but only 11 made him rich or were serious. And it's just about mismatch, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first portion. So first you qualify, do they like to spend in what you like to spend on? Do they have the right check size? Does their thesis match? People like to, um, well, there's a great question coming up that I wanna to talk to as well. People like to um, just jump at the money and that really doesn't work. So you gotta make sure that they have a thesis. So people like to have a thesis. I might really know e-commerce and payments and SaaS, I don't know agri-tech, so chances of me investing in you are, are very little. So once you've decided, do they invest in your area? Do they have the right check size? Are you at the right stage? And please, please ask for feedback at the end of every session. Be humble, be willing to learn, be coachable, it's important, because they might tell you the right thing to change in your deck to get your next investment. Then once you've done that, you've got what, what, what one of my VCs calls the beer test. So Jake Chapman was a VC lawyer out of Silicon Valley. He invested in us. and they did it very quickly. We, our round took four weeks. And the part that, that came um, back from that was he flew over to South Africa to make sure I wasn't a very short, pale Nigerian prince. And um, he had a beer with me. And that's really about making sure you can work with this person. You don't want a confrontational relationship. You want someone who is gonna have your back. And at the same time, not just pander to everything you say, 
they're, they're going to do what's best for the company as well, but it's not going to be a, a confrontational thing. Um, understand, make sure they buy into your vision. If you're not aligned on vision from day one, they're not going to be a good fit and you're going to be continuously fighting with that investor. Make sure this isn't their lunch money. If, if, this is, if this is an investor going all in on you, rather pass on it because the, the Italians have a saying, they, 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 love, love creates stress and uh, cardio releases it. Um, this is like a marriage, except there is no Saturday night cardio to forgive all the sins. There's only money, which is going to make that stress a lot worse. So you have to absolutely make sure that there is a, a personal and vision match with, with, with those shareholders. What value can they add now? Don't hire a, a board for, for future value. Everyone who comes into your board now should be strategic to getting you to the next value. If Raj, for example, was to give me $10 million tomorrow, I would need to know that I can make Raj another 100 million in the next round and how I'm going to best get the most from, from Raj's skills to, to move to that, that point. Because that's what VC is about. It's about, about me, each time I take money, I've got to do 10 times better. One of my other, my other board members always says to me, well, you wanted the bike, now ride it. So that's the important thing to remember. You've taken someone's money. Someone has earned that money in whatever way they've done. They've worked hard for it. You've got to do 10 times better with it. You better make sure you can keep that person along for the journey. You can communicate well for them and you can assure them and let them be a part of helping you make this succeed. Because if you're too arrogant, if you can't get along with them, that is going to be a problem. So that's, that's really how I'd narrow down my investors. So it'll be thesis, fit, right check size, vision, do I get along with them? Do, do they believe in me? Do I believe in them? And can I communicate effectively with them? You're on mute. Could we grab the sweat equity com com yes. com question? Go for it. That's the question from Paseka. Thanks for joining us, Paseka. Paseka is on one of our programs, Craig, um, building some great IoT solutions into one of his yeah, inventions. So sweat equity, this one comes up a lot. Okay, what you need to do, you need to find some gasoline, you need to pour it on your hair, light it and run away screaming. That, that's why I have no hair, really. No, I'm just kidding. No, so, so a lot of people, a lot of VC will come to you and say, oh, but I can bring you this and I can bring you that and that's why you should give me a discount. I've even heard of a number of infamous VCs who we all know very well and we, we know that if you're on your board, we'll never invest in you. You say, well, my brand is worth so much and you know, I value it at 2 million. I'm only going to give you 20,000 Rand but because I'm involved, magically these things will happen and you will succeed. No. Here's what's important. Yes, someone can say, I, you know, I want... 10% of your business, it's valued at 10, let's say 10 bucks just to make it easy, but I'm only going to give you five because I'm going to do ABC. You go to them, no problem at all. Pay me for the five and I will create a contract that says in the event of you delivering what you promise you're going to do within a short time box of time, usually a year, I will then give you the other five. Watch how fast those people disappear. And the ones who can deliver won't mind it. So the moment anyone makes a promise, ratchet that into a contract. Ratchets work against you, but they can also work for you. So be very careful of that and make sure you contract it in. So Craig, I just want us to also go to the chat line and um, take this question from Owen. What kind of returns VCs are looking for for early stage startups just started making revenue? So look, a lot of people promise 10x return. The reality is if you do 3x, you're good. If you look overall, most investments we make, um, it's a numbers game. You invest in 100 because two will absolutely shoot the lights out and the rest will probably be failed. You're, 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 let's say 95 will fail, three will be good lifestyle business, two will succeed. 95 of those, I expect to put them on their knees and put a bullet in their head. There, there, there's a bunch of that happening right now where a lot of my fellow VCs have killed off 95% of the portfolios because they're not going to bail them out during, during this period. Um, and in terms of what type of return we're looking for, look, everyone will say 10x, but realistically, probably 3 to 5x within 
five years is a reasonable thing. And then, then I think this goes back to Raja's question. I think you need to also speak to the person before you take the money to find out what that expectation is, because this is a five to nine year journey. And if they're not up for that, there's, there's going to be a lot of conflict. Um, if I look at my business, I had some early seed stage investors who came in, I think $20,000 for 5%. They've recently, two years ago-ish, they sold 1% for $100,000. So they made 5x just on that 1%. They've still got 4% in the can. And there's another bunch of investors who are about to see 15x in this current round and probably expecting 10x in the next round that we'll do after, after our Series A. So I think they've got to reasonably see that you have a plan for how you're going to send the right signals, grow that revenue to a stage where you can justify a check that is you know, pari passu, you know, 1% I would have bought now, uh, you know, what am I going to buy the 1% later? So if I bought 1% for 100,000, I'm hoping you in, in 18 months have got to the business where I can sell 1% for 300,000 or 500,000. That would be a, a good acceptable return. And remember, you are not your best cheerleader. The people who invest in you are your best cheerleader. So if you talk to any of my early stage investors who are still in, they will tell you how wonderful I am. Not because I am, I'm a cautionary tale. I mean, look at this, who did want this? But I've made them a lot of money and that counts for something. And, and, and when, when there's been strife, I've been willing to listen. I've been willing to say, okay, I don't have all the answers. Let's go to the board. Let's have that, that, that kind of session. It, it, and, and it might be tough. It might, it, it might be a, a very robust conversation, which means we're screaming and shouting at each other. Um, but at the end of the day, we come to a conclusion, we back each other, there's no I told you so, and we move forward and we make a lot of money. So that's important. So the returns I'd say a reasonable VC would look for is three to five X on a five to, to nine year timeline. Well, thank you so much, Craig, and thank you for being so generous with your time and your knowledge, always, you know, willing to help startups and entrepreneurs. I really appreciate it. Before we finish off, are there any closing comments you have for the startups and entrepreneurs on the line with us? Sure. You're about to embark on the hardest thing you're ever going to do, and I, I cannot at all stress this enough. Um, this is the hunger games of life choices. It's going to ruin you economically, spiritually, emotionally. Um, this is why damaged people do well. They have an appetite for abuse. Um, it's going to be hard. Don't let it get you down and don't compare yourself to everybody else because everybody else is running around at events telling you they're fine. They're great. It's amazing. They're lying. They're, they're not fine unless fine means freaked out, insecure, nervous, and emotional. I've had people go and, and pitch at events side by side with me on a panel and then come out for me with a whiskey saying they can't feed their children or pay their rent. Um, do not compare yourself. Don't give yourself a time box. Just make sure you're always moving forward because that'll drive you insane as well. Oh, I should have been there by my 30th birthday or we should have been there in three months. This, this is a true marathon. Get used to rejection. Um, it is very easy to fail. I've, uh, I've had more, more mistakes than I've had successes. And those are the things you learn from. And Clive, who is, uh, Clive Bucker is the ex-CEO of Accenture. I raised a VC fund for him and he's now on, on my board. And a brilliant man who I learn a lot from, although I'll probably never admit it. Um, no, but I do. And it, you know, what, what? Oh, it's out there. Don. Um, no, but, but honestly, you know, so there's, the, Clive always says there, there, there's no winning and, and, and losing. There's winning and learning. It's only losing if you don't learn from it. So, so once you can, you're allowed to make mistakes. Don't beat yourself up for it. It's only if you make the same mistake twice. One, once is a mistake, twice is a choice, as I like to say. Um, and, and then that's super, super important. Um, avoid the hype. Avoid false signaling. I don't care about your venture brand article. I don't care about some startup competition you won. It's never going to get you customers, never going to get you money. Don't waste your time chasing that. Build your business, build your revenue, chase your revenue, chase customers. That matters. Um, that's the only real validation you're going to need. Um, and 
it's it's also don't don't rush to to show all your mistakes. You know, people like to say, "I'm so and so, I'm a pivot." Nobody cares. You're supposed to learn from your mistakes. That's what management is. Management is making multiple decisions a day, and when they're wrong, you make a new decision and you act on it. Um, get used to rejection. You're going to hear no a lot. You're going you're to go to a thousand VCs to raise money, like Bill Gates, the richest man in the world up until recently. You know, 5,000 people later and only 11 actually, you know, did anything about it. Um, it's going to happen. Don't let it get you down. Remember those qualifying questions I asked you? It'll save you actually having rejections that would have been rejections before they, <laughs> before you even needed to have them. Um, this is stressful. This is hard. Like I said, it will bankrupt you emotionally, spiritually, and every other way. Learn to manage stakeholders, learn to communicate because you're going to shut down, communicate, keep talking to your board, make sure you have two weeks, make sure you have a beer with them or a WhatsApp. I WhatsApp with my with at least one of my board members every two days. Um, and, at, and then remember that you have more important stakeholders and the people you're married to, the people you're dating, the people around you. I promise you, you will treat them the worst because they don't know how hard this is, or at least that's what you're going to tell yourself because you're doing something impossible. Don't do that. Learn to communicate. Learn to take a moment to rest as well. That is super important. If you're burnt out, freaked out, nervous, and emotional, you're fine at the event. <laughs> um, take that time. Uh, it will get important because this is going to be hard and you're going to fail lots. You are going to fail so much. Um, so, so please make sure that you're a little bit kind to yourself. I'm terrible at it, um, but luckily I have good friends around me who, who kind of do, do notice and take care. Have some good friends. That helps too. Have some understanding friends. Some of my best friends are all from the ecosystem because they're the only people who ever see me because I'm always working. Um, do right by your shareholders. It's easy. Don't worry, I'm almost done. It, it's very easy to go, oh, they're all against me and they don't understand my vision. No, no, no. These people have given you their money. They are doing more for you than anybody else out there. Appreciate that. Play your own part well. Understand that because you have a responsibility to them more than yourself. And, and you have a secondary responsibility that possibly comes first. And this is going to sound counterintuitive. Take care of your staff. Those people mean everything. If they're not family for you, if you're not willing to go starving so they can eat, you're never going to succeed because they will take care of your customers. And if you take care of your team and your customers, you're taking care of revenue. If you're taking care of revenue, you're taking care of your shareholders. And speak again. Trust your shareholders. Speak to them. They have done something for you. They've taken money they wouldn't have given their own children and helped you succeed with your dream. You, you, you need to honor that. And the best way you can do that is honor your team, honor yourself, honor the people around you. Be honest with yourself. Take the criticism. Learn from it. Learn from your mistakes. Um, and keep going. Because like I said, this is, this is by, you will never find anything as hard as this. I promise you. Wow. Thank you so much, Craig. I mean, as always, you know, we've had so many conversations. I can't count them. So I love learning from you. And I'm sure the attendees really enjoyed the session. They've stayed online, you know, all through. And we've got such lovely questions and interactions and engagements. I'll share all of the links and this video link with all of you so that you can go back and learn from some of Craig's life lessons and startup lessons. So thank you, Craig. I'm sure down the line, I'll call you again to get online with me because there's so much more I think you can share. So for the rest of you guys, have a lovely evening and uh, enjoy the rest of lockdown. Uh, use the opportunity to grow and to work on yourself and your business as well. Thank you, Craig. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you everybody.